Well, the early Christians lived in the power of the Holy Spirit. When we read the book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit come in power and authority at Pentecost, and we see the early church living in the power of the Holy Spirit. And this miraculous new life had them amazed. The people were amazed. The world was amazed. It actually turned their word upside down because of the power of the Holy Spirit that was upon them. And so if you have ever asked what happened to those wonderful things, you'll be excited to know that right now in these days, many people are experiencing and rediscovering the power of the Holy Spirit and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Once again, there are healings and miracles taking place, prophecy and other gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're being seen and heard. There's love, joy, peace. And all of the wonderful fruit of the Spirit are being experienced by people all over the world. Every person who is receiving a new kind of life in the power of the Spirit. And so I want to encourage you today, when you take your bulletin home, to read of the testimonies of what is happening in people's life right here at Malvern Christian Assembly. We have a couple of testimonies in in this week's bulletin. And so I thought, you know what, instead of me trying to figure out what to write about for 52 Sundays of the year times 10 years, I am getting weary of trying to find something interesting for you to read. I thought, you know what, let's put people's testimonies in the bulletin. Let's just have your story printed in the bulletin. And so we have a couple this week, and uh, we already have a couple for next week. So what I'm asking you is you write down your testimonies of what God has done in your life, and you send them to us. How's that? So if you want them printed, you send them to us, and we will print your story. And what it will do is as we read it, it will encourage our faith and give God the glory. Amen? We need to tell our stories. We have lots of stories to tell. And so we'll use this to do so. So I encourage you to read uh, these great testimonies that, that are here. Also listening to the at the testimonies of those who come to uh, Tuesday Hour of Power, healings and uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit and jobs that are found and miracles that are happening and Friday night prayer and Wednesday morning. There are great stories that we need to tell. Even the stories, you know, we're, we're going to print some. I hope you don't mind. I think Darren and Lynn, you know, even uh, shared that their little girl, Faith, was baptized in the Holy Spirit following the service we had with all the children and so on. Faith is how old? Oh, it's Michaela. How old is she? Five. Michaela, speaking in tongues. Five years old, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. (laughs) Hallelujah. I want to share a story about two little kids, a five-year-old and a seven-year-old that prayed for their dad as he was going into surgery. You hear me now. A five- and a seven-year-old laid their hands on their daddy as he was going into surgery. And the surgery was canceled because the doctor said there's absolutely nothing wrong with him, and they pushed him right back out. (laughs) Hallelujah! That's a miracle, my friend. Glory to God. Children, the faith. Children, praying, believing, trusting. My friends, we need to go back to that. Trusting God, believing his word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Great stories. This week I just met with a gentleman that came and joined Anthony Richards from Teen Challenge Jamaica. And in my office was sharing that he was addicted to crack cocaine for 23 years. That's a long time. 23 years addicted, ruined his life, his family, everything he had. He would do anything for a fix. He tried everything. He tried every program, everything that was available to try to kick the habit to no avail. His brother even had him put in jail, hoping that there he would get some help. And my friend, it wasn't until he was referred to Teen Challenge Jamaica and met Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior that he was completely delivered, completely delivered. I met the man. He has been free and delivered for eight years. Hallelujah. That's a miracle. Any of you know people that are addicted or perhaps you or yourself, you know it's a miracle. It's not a 12-step that you hope that you won't go back. 
It is a miracle, life-changing miracle transformation. And it's happening all over the world, all over the world. And my friend, it all begins with salvation. It all begins at salvation, which is found in no one else but in Jesus and Jesus alone. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what you try. It doesn't matter where you go. If you do not surrender to Jesus, you will find no hope in all of the other things that are offered. Jesus Christ is the one that can save you and set you free. He is the one that can save your family, your friends, and set them free. Hallelujah. Wonderful testimonies, and I want you to keep them coming because it is encouraging. It builds up our faith. It says, I have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. Hallelujah. And we forget. We need to speak. We are timid, and that's why we need the Spirit of God in our lives. That's why we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We are timid, and even as Canadians, we are polite and timid. We don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to shake anything up. We want to be unnoticed wherever we go. But that's why we need the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Spirit that will cause us to speak and give the good news. My friends, we're not going around judging people. We're not going around putting them down or criticizing their lifestyle. What we do as believers is we share our story. And when I share my story, it will touch some of you in this house, and it will connect with you, and you will hear it, and hope will rise up. And you'll surrender your life to Jesus, our testimony. But we're so quiet and so silent. This tongue here needs to be released for the Lord. We have a lot to say about everything else, don't we? I'm always amazed. It's people that talk so much and are so exuberant outside the church, and they come in the church, they are the most quiet, timid people I've ever met. I don't understand that. I could see the other way around. We're exuberant in here and out there. We're a little bit intimidated by the world. We need the Holy Spirit to move in our lives. And my friend, it starts with salvation. If we don't know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we can't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God bursting out of us. To become a Christian, if there's anyone here that does not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to share this with you. And for those of us who are, it never hurts to hear it repeated because you know what? If you are born again and you are a believer in Jesus Christ, what I'm sharing, you can take out to your friends and your family and your neighbors. Amen? There's always someone that needs the Lord. Always. And so to become a Christian doesn't mean that we accept a philosophy. When that man was delivered from his crack cocaine addiction, he didn't need some more rules, a set of rules or steps on how to do it. We've all heard enough of that. If you do this and this and this and this in your marriage, if you do this, this and this and this and this to kick the habit, if you do this, 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 to become a Christian is not to accept a philosophy or a set of rules even if they're good, or some abstract principles. To become a Christian means to have God come and live in you. You see, that's revolutionary. Because if we stick to that, then we don't become religious. We're not trying to push religion on people. We're not trying to push even going to church on people. To become a Christian means to have God come and live in us. Wow. To become a Christian is to repent. It's to repent. And repent, what does repent mean? It means a turning around. It means that you admit that you're on the wrong road and you want to get it right. That's what repent is. There's, a, there's an acknowledgement in your life that I need God. And where I'm heading and where I'm going, I know it's wrong. And you know what? You don't have to convince people of that. The people that you rub shoulders with every day know that. There's a God consciousness. There's, a, there's something in our heart that tells us between right and wrong. They know. The problem is not in knowing. It's admitting. 
admitting, coming to that place when you finally admit, you know what, I am heading in the wrong direction, and I want to do what's right. To become a Christian is to be transformed to be renewed. So it's not accepting a set of rules or some kind of religious ordinance and religious rules. To become a Christian is to be transformed. It's to be renewed. You see how that's different than under any other religions of the world? It's to be transformed from the inside out. It's to, be, it's to turn our lives around and go the opposite way of where we're going. We're absolutely transformed. I was once this way, now I'm this way. I'm totally changed. I am totally renewed. That's what being a Christian is. And to become a Christian is to be forgiven. No other religion offers that. Wow. So take an inventory here. To be a Christian, to have come, God the creator of the heavens and the earth come and live in you. That should absolutely blow everybody's minds. If you share that with your friends, co-workers, I have God living in me. You'll get their attention. See, but we try with all kinds of, you shouldn't be doing this, or maybe you should have tried that. Maybe, you know, God doesn't like this, and your lifestyle, uh. And so people have the impression that they got to clean up before they come to God. None of us can clean up and come to God. It's never going to be good enough. We need to ask God to come and live in us. And he will do the cleaning from the inside out. He will transform us. He will change us. And he will forgive us. That is absolutely insane. Because when you think of it, he forgives you and me all of the sins we've ever committed. And the Bible tells us as if they never existed. Just think of that. Just think how many people would love to be forgiven. How much they would love to just not live in the past and constantly feel guilty and ashamed for the things they've done. And you and I have that privilege that when we came to Christ, he says he forgave. We just sang it. Through the blood of Jesus, he washed away my sin. And he says, as if they never existed. So who's the one that keeps reminding you of the things you've done? Would it be God? It just says that he doesn't remember. Your sins are as far as the east is from the west. Remember them no more. So when you feel condemned or shamed or guilty, guess who is the accuser of the brethren? Wow. So a Christian, how can we not be rejoicing? I have God living in me. I've repented of my ways. I knew that I was heading in the wrong direction, and I changed course. I admitted to God, I am wrong, you are right. I've made a mess, you can fix it. And then he says, I forgive you. Of all the things you've done, I forgive you. And not only has he forgiven us, but every day we have this forgiveness available to us every day. We live forgiven. I could stop right here. We should all be falling over going, oh my God, woe is me. A man of unclean lips. Serious? The God that created the heavens and the earth has forgiven you and me. Forgiven. Forgiven. We are born again. The Bible tells us that when our spirit comes alive, when God comes to live in us, we are born again. Nicodemus didn't understand what Jesus was referring to. Jesus had to explain it to him. And perhaps you're going to run into some people that don't understand what that means and they don't even like this term, and we shied away from the term born again because we sound goofy, right? If you say to someone, I'm born again, yeah, good for you. You're one of those. But what does it mean? If we could explain it maybe to our friends and to our families. So let me try today even explain it again so that we can take it back to friends and families perhaps because some of us perhaps 
It's been a while. You see, what happened was when Adam and Eve were created, they were created with a body, soul, and spirit, right? That's how we are. We have body, soul, and spirit. Now, when Adam and Eve broke fellowship with God, because of their rebellion, they broke fellowship with God, their spirit died. They were dead spiritually. So the body and soul is still functioning. They're dead spiritually. And since then, every one of us, each one of us that has been born in this world is dead spiritually. See, we're made of three parts, body, soul, spirit. When we know our body. We know what that is. Our soul is all our emotions and our psyche, and where our minds, and all these things. And then there's a spirit. You see, the spirit was created to commune with God. It is through our spirit, not body, not soul, that we were going to fellowship with God. His spirit alive in our spirit. Does that make sense? And so when fellowship was broken with God, the spirit died. And every one of us is dead spiritually until, until we accept, we receive the life that God is offering us again. We need to be born again. You see, we were once created Body, soul, spirit, very alive with God. Adam and Eve were walking with him, fellowshipping with him, close to him. When they rebelled against him, it says that we are dead spiritually. And so you and I, and that's why we struggle with our flesh and our body and our soul, and we crave all kinds of things because our spirit is dead and so what happens when we offer ourselves, you see, our most desperate need is not for religion. It's not for a set of rules that we try to appease an angry God. That's what most religions are. Our attempt, man's attempt to appease an angry God. To be a Christian, my friend, is to recognize that the spirit in you is dead until you allow Christ's spirit to come in you and revive you. And that's what it is. If you've accepted Christ, the life-giving flow, the blood that was shed for us, if you accept him and receive him, you don't get up the next day and say, I'm going to go to church. I can't wait to go to church. That's not the first thing that happens. First thing that happens, my friend, is your spirit comes alive. <gasps> it would be like if you were dead physically and they put the paddles to your heart and they give you that electric shock. And all of a sudden you go, <gasps> you've seen people, life comes back to their body. It's like, <gasps> and they take this breath. That's what happens to our spirit. And so when I, when I read at the beginning of the service, and if you read Romans 8, you'll understand what is happening. That we were once dead spiritually. We were controlled by our body and our soul. That's how we're controlled every day. And the people you see every day, that's how they live. They are controlled by their body and their soul. Their spirit is dead. No wonder we're such a mess. Everybody's doing what they think is right in their own eyes, right? There's no direction. It's your body, your soul, whatever you feel like, whatever you feel like that morning, whatever you want to do, whatever you think is best for you, whatever you want to accomplish, it's all about you, your body, your soul. I'm hungry, I'm starving, I got to go get some food. I'm angry today, I'm depressed today, I got to pop some pills. We are control by our body and our soul, our mind. But when we accept Christ, we receive this life-giving power. It comes and it revives our spirit. 
And that's why we use the term, you were born again. <gasps> I have God living in me. The Spirit of God, He has just revived me. And that's what happens when we give our life to Jesus. Our most desperate need is not for some rules, not from some set of principles, not for some things that we try to live by while we are here on earth, because we'll never live up to anything that God requires, because it's not about what we can do, it's what he's done for us. It's what he's done for us. He has made us alive, the Bible says. He has made you alive and me alive once again. So really, what we see all around us are dead men walking, right? They're all alive physically, soul, moods, mind, but they're dead spiritually. And so now that explains why your friends and your family and your coworkers act the way they do, doesn't it? They're dead. They're walking dead. They're walking dead. And until, so for you to say, you know, try to share all kinds of long lists of things of do's and no, that's not going to fix anything. That's not going to fix anything if I try that with my family. What will fix it is when they come alive, when their spirit is revived. So how is that done? Well, we encourage people. We pray for them. You see, you and I, when I was saved, when I received this new life, I had to realize that I was lost, that I was going in the wrong direction. I had to admit that I was wrong. You see, you can't have your spirit come alive and continue the way you're always doing and just add him to it. It's not going to work. Admit that we're wrong. Admit that we've blown it. Admit that we need God. And then we ask Jesus to come into our lives and be our, our Savior and our Lord. And the key, my friend, is the moment you ask Jesus to come into your life and revive you, you need to believe that he has done it the moment you asked him to. That's called faith. You don't wait till you feel different. Maybe there's something that happens to you. When you ask the Lord of Lords to come into your life and revive you, Make me alive in you. He will do it the moment you ask. The moment you ask. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. And once you've received Jesus as your Savior, God lives in you. His Holy Spirit lives in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if we are alive spiritually, our body or our soul just lines up with the Spirit. So now we're no longer controlled by our body and our soul. We are controlled by the Spirit. And the body and soul must be in line with the Spirit. Does that make sense? The Spirit of God now lives in you. You're alive again. <gasps> I'm alive. I have breath. I have the breath of God. I have the spirit of God. Now my body and my soul must align itself, themselves, to the spirit. And so many of us have been saved perhaps for a long time. You remember the day you were saved. You says, yes, I know I'm different. I know God makes this change in my life. I know I'm transformed. As Paul said, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. He's a new creation. I know I'm different. I know that the Spirit of God lives in me. However, I feel that things have gone back to the same old, same old. I feel kind of dry. Anyone here? You kind of remember coming alive in Christ. Perhaps sharing your faith, embracing everybody, and feeling this great joy, but that's kind of past tense. We've kind of gone back to our old ways, maybe. Have you ever wondered why that is? Anybody but me? 
You wonder why that is. Sometimes you think, you look at your life and you think, boy, this is a dry spell right here. This is dry. I feel like I'm operating in the old set of rules. Have you ever felt that? Paul sure did. Paul says, wow, I am struggling here. Back and forth. I can't do the things I want to do, and I do the things that I want to do. If you ever wonder why that is, is because your body and your soul have been in charge for many years before you knew Christ, right? However long that is. That's why a child of five years old can be saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. They have no baggage. No baggage. Just faith and trust. But when you and I have had our body and our soul rule for so long, and then the Spirit of God comes in us and we are alive spiritually, no longer dead... The Spirit of God takes control, but the body and soul, not too thrilled about that, right? Have you ever felt like you constantly, like Paul says, you have to subject your body and your soul like David did? Bless the Lord, oh my soul. What is wrong with you? Why are you so downcast, oh my soul? Why is that? Because the body and the soul begins to take over again. Because it's been in the driver's seat forever. So we need the spirit of God to control our body and our soul. And the way we do that, my friend, is to get an infusion, a baptism, a drenching, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit all over us. You see, I have the spirit of God in me. It's a, it's a personal experience when I invited Jesus Christ in my life. It was personal. You see, you can't, you can't accept Christ, be saved, and think your whole family gets in on it with you. And so many people have misinterpreted Acts chapter 10 when, when uh, Peter speaks of Cornelius and his household, and he said, you know, Cornelius and his whole household will be saved. So people have taken that, that if I get saved, my whole household gets in on it. Wrong, wrong, wrong. A few verses before that in Acts 10, it says, everyone, everyone must believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and confess it and they shall be saved. You don't get in on your family's salvation. It's not a package deal. I get saved and a 10 of us get saved. And so we need, we need this empowerment. We need this infusion of the Holy Spirit. We need a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Just like the Spirit of God came in me when I was saved and gave my life to Jesus, now I need to activate the Spirit of God. I need to activate it. I need to have this power from on high so that I can pour out what God has done for us. I can do mighty acts in his name as the Spirit of God is poured out. You see, many of us perhaps have misunderstood Romans 10.10. It says, if you believe with your heart, you are justified. And if you confess with your mouth, you'll be saved. And I'm wondering if sometimes, even in the church, people believe in God in their heart, but have never confessed it with their mouths. You see, it's a personal thing. I personally have to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, but I need to confess it so that you know that I am a follower of Jesus Christ. There's the believing and the confessing. Same with the Holy Spirit baptism. Jesus says, I have a gift for you. I want you to receive this gift. And so we receive the gift, but it says that we need to open our mouths. When we are baptized with the Holy Spirit, it says we need to open our mouths and God will fill it. Many of us just want this power. We want to, this anointing, but we will not open our mouths to confess it. And the way we confess it through the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not in English, but in an unknown tongue. And so when I am saved, 
I, I receive Christ. I believe in my heart that he is my Savior and my Lord. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. And I tell everyone that needs to hear it. When I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit, when I am endued with power from on high, Holy Spirit comes to activate the Spirit in us so that we may do great things, great wonders. It says mighty acts of God. And the church, my friend, has been absolutely silenced in that category. We might be born again, but we keep this private until Jesus comes back. How will they hear? How will we spread the good news if we don't speak? I desire that this entire church, every, every one of us, children, young adults, youth, middle-aged, seniors, be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We need this baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need to be drenched. We need to be saturated with the Holy Spirit so that we can do great exploits for God. And the way you know that you're baptized in the Holy Spirit is when you open your mouth, God will fill it with unknown tongue. You see, when a baby talks for the first time, do you think that your baby or your toddler has gone through the mental gymnastic And before he or she says, da-da, they think it through? Yes? No? Of course not. You don't even need to tell a child to open their mouth. One day, the child goes, blah, 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 blah. They don't stop themselves and go, wow, does that ever sound silly? Why am I saying that? They open their mouths. God fills it. Mind fills it. You begin to speak, da-da. Then it's a little more and a little more. When we are baptized with the Holy Spirit, when the power of God comes upon us, we are to open our mouths. Psalm says, open your mouth and I will fill it. Now, if you speak English while you're being baptized in the Holy Spirit, you can't speak two languages at the same time. It doesn't, it can't. It says in an unknown tongue. So you can't speak English and you can't speak the language that you know. You trust God to fill your mouth, and it says in God's word, you begin to speak. You begin. You begin. So to stand there and wait. It doesn't work. But you have to begin. I'm sorry, but you have to begin. You have to open your mouth. So if I've accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior and I just... People are looking at you going, what is your problem? But if I say, I am praise, I love Jesus. I accept it in my life. He has changed my life. By his blood, I am healed. I am forgiven. I'm confessing it. People can benefit from it, Yes. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, it says, they began to speak. They began to speak. And it's nothing that you know. It's nothing that's familiar. You just open your mouth, and he will fill it. And when he does, my friend, the tongues is not what we concentrate on. It's the initial evidence. You know that you know that you know that you've been baptized, that you receive this power from on high, that activate your spirit. And now there's boldness and courage, and there's just something that comes over you that you want to tell everybody, you want to lay hands on everybody, you want to pray, you want people to be healed and set free, and mighty works are declared in our midst. But if we keep sitting on that, then no one else will ever come, and we will not reach the world before Jesus comes back. We need to be endued with power from on high, no different than the disciples in the upper room. Jesus says you can't go anywhere without it. And so I want to encourage you this week to read Acts chapter 10. Would you do that? Read chapter 10 of the book of Acts and read how Cornelius met the Lord and what happened there. Because when Peter was called to Cornelius' house. Perhaps you felt like that. But he walks into a room of unbelievers, Romans. You don't hang out with Gentiles. 
Perhaps there's a group of people that you don't hang out with. Shame on you. But perhaps there is. All of a sudden, you're invited to this group of people that you don't even associate with, perhaps at your workplace, and God is leading you to share the good news. That's what happened to Peter. Peter had been baptized in the Holy Spirit back in Acts 2. So when he goes to Cornelius' house, he says, I'm not sure why I'm here, but I had a dream that said I needed to come here. Cornelius says, well, that's great because I had a vision that you were coming. And so he comes and he says, why am I here? And so Cornelius shares, the Lord showed me that he was going to bring to you, so here we are. I've gathered my whole family, and we're here to listen to you. So Peter begins to preach the gospel, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. It said that immediately the people received the message and began speaking in tongues. What? Can you imagine his shock? He thought that was only for the Jews, the elite. And all of a sudden, this bunch of people he's never met before accept his message, they accept Christ, and they begin to speak in tongues. So Peter's looking around at the other fellows that are with him, and he says, how can we deny them being baptized in water? They're speaking in tongues already. So they baptized them in water. So I want you to see how natural it is to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not a, an option. It's part of the Christian life. And so just before we go to communion, I'm just going to invite you to just close your eyes for a moment. And I know there are only one visitor. There's only one visitor, I think, today. So perhaps all of us are saved. Know Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God is living in you. Perhaps you recognize today that you need power, you need boldness, you need courage. You're kind of living under the radar. And you need this power from on high to give you boldness and courage about your faith. But also, Spirit of God will empower you to do mighty works at your workplace, in your home, wherever you are. There will be such a boldness that in the past you might just come and go, but now you can't pass this person because the Holy Spirit says, Stop! I want you to pray for her. I want you to speak to him. Whatever that might be, the Spirit of God will empower you and he will fill your mouth. Anyone here today, you have never accepted Christ. Your spirit is dead. You know it. And you need to come alive. You need to have God live in you. This is not religion. This is a relationship with Jesus Christ. His spirit coming to live in you, to revive you and give you life, abundant life, eternal life. Anyone here at all before we have communion together, would you raise your hand if you're here today? We'll pray for you. We'll pray with you. Anyone in this house today? You need to come alive. You need to have God live in you. You have never invited him in your life and said, take over my life. I admit that I'm wrong and I need you. Come and live in me. All right, everyone here, you know Jesus. You have the spirit of God living in you. You recognize today that perhaps it's not, it's not what it was. Perhaps, the, as we would say, the fire is gone out. You need, you need a Holy Spirit baptism. You need a absolute drenching. You need a soaking. You need to be covered and baptized and immersed in the Holy Spirit so that the power of God be at work in your life. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead would be at work in your life today. Anyone here, you'd say, that's me. That's me. My life is dry. I am not moving ahead. I want all that God has for me. Anyone here, you'd raise your hand today. Looking through everywhere. Yes, I see your hand. Thank you. God bless you. Yes, I see your hand. Any more hands? Any more people? Yes, I see your hand. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Spirit of the living God, you see every hand that was raised. And Lord, we know that the gift of the Holy Spirit, the baptism, the drenching from the Holy Spirit is a gift to us. And it is for everyone. It is for everyone. So Lord, I pray right now that you would baptize your people. You would baptize them from power from on high, from heaven. And Lord, the initial evidence as they begin to praise and thank you, God, that you will fill their mouths. And they will know that the Spirit of God has come upon them. And there's a power and a boldness and a courage that will surge from their hearts. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, you could be baptized right here in your pew. You could be baptized at the altar. You could be baptized in your car. You could be baptized in your house. On your way to work, you just ask and receive and open your mouth, and he will fill it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you did not leave us without any power or boldness or courage. But God, it lives in us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you move upon our lives and you will guide and direct and do mighty works. Greater things shall he do in my name. Why? Because you have the Holy Ghost in you. You have Holy Spirit all over you. And you are to declare, declare the praises of our God. You are to declare the goodness of our God. Amen? Amen. And so before we have, I'm going to invite the servers to come and distribute. Would you begin to speak praises unto him in your own language that he has given you? Your special prayer language that he's given you. Just close yourself off. And if you don't have tongues, you ask God to baptize you and open your mouth and he will fill it. There's no better time than right now. So just close yourself in and just begin to thank him and praise him. Would you do that? Hallelujah. 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 Spirit of God, fall fresh on us today. Fall fresh on us today that we can declare your mighty acts. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord, that your spirit is alive in us. Now we are controlled by the Spirit today, not by our flesh, not by our soul, but by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. 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 For those who ask for the baptism, God, I pray you would pour out your Spirit on them today. Pour out your Spirit today, God. Hallelujah. That this church, this body of believers would be empowered, God, to be bold and courageous and to go out to the ends of the earth and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And that's what we're doing right now as we share in this communion. Proclaiming. Proclaiming. And my friend, we don't want to just do it in here. We want to do it out there. Amen? And so as you receive the emblems, thank Jesus today for your new life. Thank Jesus for the Spirit of God that is in you. Thank Him for the power and the courage and the boldness that you have today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
worthy is the Lamb. Hallelujah. Acts 10, verse 34 says, Then Peter began to speak. He says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. Hallelujah, that's us today. But they heard them speak in tongues and praising God. And Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, Peter goes on later on to say to the, the, the Jewish believers, the, the devout men that couldn't understand why the Spirit had come to the Gentiles. And Peter says, but as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them. As he had come on us at the beginning, then I remembered, Peter said, what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we thank Jesus. We thank him for dying for us. We thank him for giving his life for us. We thank him that he's coming back again. We thank him that he gives us life and life abundant while we're here on earth. And we thank him for Holy Spirit that he sent to us when he ascended into heaven. He sent us Holy Spirit. So we say thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for a complete work. Complete work. Now he says, remember every time you get together, remember what I have done for you. Also remember that I sent Holy Spirit and that I am coming back for a church, for a church that is absolutely, absolutely beautiful to him clothed in righteousness, forgiven of our sins, full of love and grace and peace, without spot or wrinkle, he said, coming back for my church. And we need to be busy about our Father's business. We need to be busy. And how are we busy? Not by running around in our own strength, but under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we are sent out today to do mighty works. Are you ready for mighty works? Are you scared? A little, a little, but we're not going in our own strength, right? We're going under the anointing and the power of Holy Spirit. So Lord Jesus, we thank you that your body was broken for us so that we can have life. We can be alive spiritually and we can serve you with our whole heart. Let's take the bread together. Hallelujah. 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 We can't be silent. We can't be silent. For all that he has done, we can't be silent. We can't be timid or intimidated. Absolutely not. The lady at the grocery store, the one behind the cash, the guy at the gas station, they need Jesus, my friend. They need their spirit to come alive so that they're not dead in their trespasses, but they are alive in Christ. That's what they need. I've received it. And Jesus says in his word that he shows no favoritism. It's not because of who I am or who you are. 
because of his grace. And he wants to extend that grace to your family, your neighbors, your co-workers. The blood that flowed through his veins, the blood of Jesus has washed away my sins and yours, forever removed. Thank you, Jesus. Let's take the cup together. Hallelujah. Let's stand together as we conclude our time together. I'm going to invite those of you who have raised your hand if you'd like. We would love to pray with you today. I have some people right here full of the Holy Spirit that have experienced the baptism, that are bold and courageous, that want to pray with you. So you don't have to leave right now. You can stay and come forward to the front if you'd like to do that. If you need to go today, God bless you. We'll see you next week or Wednesday, whenever we get together again. But take it with you. Take Holy Spirit with you everywhere you go. Those of you that want prayer, I'm going to invite you to come forward right now as we take time to pray with you and for you. God bless you today. Hallelujah.